I am just so thrilled for today. Today we have Patrick Weaver. He's somebody that I love following on Facebook. I love your posts so much. They encourage me. They speak truth to me. I'm just like, hallelujah. And today I get to interview him and ask him questions about abuse within the Christian circle. And so I am just really looking forward to this. And Joy Forrest is here with us too. So it's going to be really great. Um, Patrick and Joy, do y'all well, Joy, do you want to just say hello, introduce yourself? And then Patrick, you want to introduce yourself too as well? Yes. It, just in case anybody's watching, I am the, the founder and executive director of Call to Peace Ministries, and we are a ministry that provides holistic services from a biblical, scriptural, I know that might turn some people off, Christian uh, basis. We have support groups, um, advocacy, church partnership team that will go in and help uh, train churches, and we do all of this uh, without charging. So, and we, we really do welcome you, Patrick. We are always grateful to have you here. Um, we appreciate your ministry and your work and your story. Oh, yes. always glad to be here. Always glad to be here. I'm, I, uh, am Patrick Weaver and, uh, from Patrick Weaver Ministries. Uh, my, my passion and my heart is, is, uh, advocacy, uh, for the abused. Uh, it's, it's, it's what I do in honor of my mother. Uh, who was also uh, an abuse victim, which is a um, very, very personal subject for me uh, and the plight of God's daughters. So I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Call to Peace. So I, I, I'm, I'm wanting you guys to be in the forefront. I'm just glad to be here supporting it. We appreciate Thank you. It. And as I was mentioning, as you're mentioning that, I was talking to our advocate intake coordinator yesterday, and we are hitting a record number, which I know we feel like we say that all the time, but we really are, again, hitting a record number of requests for advocates. She opened her email Monday morning, and there was eight requests that of women with stories wow. that to talk to her. It'll be a two-hour intake and all free, nothing, we don't charge anything for advocate intake. Um, we'll be talk to her and help her understand what's going on in her situation, provide her an advocate, get her into a support group, send a church partner liaison to talk to the church. All of this is free of charge. And we have people that work full-time doing this so that it's free of charge. And we're in the middle of a fundraising. It's um, Domestic Violence Awareness Month, our largest campaign of the year. Our goal is $135,000, and that is to sustain our operating costs at this point. And we are not even halfway through. But we had a matching grant that was given to us on Friday of $25,000. So every dollar given will be matched up to $25,000. And so we can do this. We can partner together. So I do plea. Um, we don't want, to, we are not going to turn people away, but we will have to put people on wait lists and refer people out. And we don't know other people that are doing the same thing that we're doing free of charge, uh, support groups, advocacy. So it's just a, uh, we definitely say, please donate, please join us in this mission, and let's get started with the interview. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So our first question of the day is, how does abuse conceal itself within the Christian community? Joy or me? Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm going to look at you start. Oh, if I want to ask any other questions, I certainly will. Okay. <laughs> I think the Christian community is in and of itself um, covert in its theology and in its, um, I would just say, attempt to mask God's heart through denomination and otherwise present man's own thought with regards to how God wants us to deal with certain issues. And so it's difficult when you are preaching a theology of complement complementarianism and or patriarchy, uh, it's difficult for the woman to see herself as equal in that environment. So it's conditioning that causes for, I believe, a lot of the uh, issue with regards to how is the wolf and or how are abusers concealed within the Christian community. It's built into our theology. 
it's built into the way in which a lot of churches uh, view, treat, minister to women. Uh, women are subjugated in the church. So if you're subjugated in the church, it stands to reason that a home should also be a place of sacrifice. And we go one step farther by saying the sacrifice that the Bible is referring to is to any and all situations and or men. And when we don't correct the lies, when we don't address the issues that result from that kind of theology, it only makes then the abuser fit right in. And it only causes for then the victim to believe this is a God assignment. Yes. Yeah. I want to say something too on that. It's, it's not necessarily a com I've, I have friends who are complementarian. Um, I've been in churches. I probably am that are complementarian, but they teach it in a different way. So I like it better when True. you say patriarchal. True. Because truly, if they're following Jesus, Jesus was one who had power and position and not saying, you know, whether you believe in that or not. But Jesus didn't use his power and position to lord it over others. He served and he served came under. Out. Right. Right. So, you know, Philippians chapter two, that he made himself as nothing that he who was who was even though he existed in the form of God, he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped as he, because he didn't, he didn't assert his rights and he right. didn't look over. And so that's what gets me is that it's, there's, it's just not even not, it's just non-Christian to have <laughs> a theology that is, is promoting people, lording it over other people. But that's what happens. I was talking to a woman yesterday and she said that church, I mean, like I, she goes, I hate that church. I hate that church. And I understand because I saw the way the church handled it was basically you submit, you bow down. As long as he's not asking you to sin, you have to submit to everything he says. And they were teaching it as obedience, which is not what it means in the Greek. Right. No. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And that, the, 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 you know, because there is no universal unilateral theology in Christianity. You don't know what you're going to get. Right. And so it really does come down to the teaching. Uh, and I think a part of what we have to do in order to promote agency among and for victims is to educate them on the word. What does the word say? Mm -hmm. Then you line that up with your church or those leaders in church, your husband, line these things up with the truth, the truth that you own and that is incomparable to, I don't care what the pastor said, I don't care what the ministry said, I don't care what the abuser said, what's your truth? What's and God's once, truth? yeah, what's God's truth, right? And once we start from that, we can we can start cultivating and activating agency. What's God's truth? Own that truth, and don't let anyone make you think otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think it's the, His truth is is so twisted by our so many of our churches. Um, right. The way I did it, I did it for years. I thought that it meant to bow, bow down in blind obedience. I read First Peter three is that Sarah obeyed Abraham and mm -hmm. called the <laughs> Lord, and Sarah lied for Abraham. So I thought right. I was to do all of those things, and so it's really understanding. Um, it is what things mean. But Sarah didn't give in to fear. It also says in that passage, and I sure was. <laughs> right, 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 right. And that makes me excited for our church partnership program. As we were interviewing Jim Upchurch the other day, he said, you know, when he went through um, the protect the flock and training and work with men, he started realizing, oh, wow, this, some of this stuff I need to grow in it too as well. And he's like, it made me a better husband. It made me a better father. It made me a better pastor. And so I think sometimes what we don't know, we do, and we don't realize yeah what we're saying or what we're teaching is actually perpetrating abuse within the congregation. And so right. it, I think it's important for every pastor to be aware of these dynamics and what they're doing that could be possibly keeping a woman trapped in something that could ultimately take her life. Absolutely. Absolutely. It has to be seen viewed from that perspective. 
and I think once it, it, it would, it probably won't be most, it will be some churches. It will be those churches that also have to start being identified because victims in a lot of instances, survivors as well, don't know how to determine if that church is in fact safe. They don't know how because there aren't many ways in which the church will identify itself as safe, even when it is. And so those churches who have a heart for the abused, they really have to put that heart on display because it is concealed oftentimes uh, by the normal, usual order of business preaching because most won't preach this subject uh, on any regularity or, or, or with any frequency. So a victim, or rather churches that are serving uh, the abused, they have to put that on display uh, as much as any other ministry that they have in that building. Amen. I believe that wholeheartedly. And I know that um, our churches that are connected with us, um, our church partners, um, pastoral liaisons have talked about the impacts of being in their church because it changed the way they preached. And they yeah. began preaching about domestic abuse and what it is and preaching against that and advocating for women from the pulpit. Um, Absolutely. Such a difference in their church um, and created a safe place for women to come forward that need to come forward and feel safe um, to share what's going on with their pastor. So I cannot echo that enough. That was amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. So let's talk about wolves in sheep's clothing. <laughs> <laughs> What are some key characteristics of wolves and sheep's clothing within the church? <laughs> you know, the, the, and let me say this, because I think a lot of the advocacy community has, and I'm not faulting it, and I'm not, I'm not saying that it is entirely untrue. A lot of emphasis is focused on the narcissist, this individual who has been home diagnosed and otherwise we have created, uh, in essence, the image of the abuser is this uh, overt or covert narcissist. In and of itself, that isn't necessarily a bad thing, but the problem arises when we try to put all abusers into that category. And then we start then trying to identify an abuser or a potential abuser from this perspective of narcissistic uh, tendencies, right? The abuser or the wolf will never be easily detected and or identifiable by these characteristics, quote unquote, narcissist. <laughs> Because the actual DSM-5 uh, definition or, or, or um, de yeah, definition of narcissist uh, it doesn't even contain the word abuse. It does not contain the word abuse. And it is a reflection of internal dysfunctional reasoning that represents a pattern of thought and belief but it is not always expressed in the same way. And you can have five different narcissists in a room and they will all be expressing behavior relative to in completely different ways. There are introverted narcissists who you would never know is a narcissist. And so one of the things that we have to do is begin to simply identify abuse apart from the quote unquote narcissist, because that creates and complicates the ability to identify individuals who may be operating as sheep in wolf's clothing. The wolf will operate 
as your next door neighbor or an individual who is going to display all of the quote unquote normal uh, behavioral characteristics. There's going to be no difference between the wolf and the person you think is the nicest person in the church. Amen. There's going to be no difference because they wouldn't be covert or a wolf if they displayed behavior that gave them away, right? So you're not going to identify them in your first meeting uh, as someone who's quote unquote a wolf. What you're going to be able to do in your interaction with them is maintain your boundaries and also pay attention to behavior that starts to look like controlling, um, selfish, uh, overbearing, abrasive, uh, folk who turn Bible to their advantage, to take advantage, mm -hmm. folk who are perhaps in leadership positions, who demand loyalty at all costs, Absolutely, that one, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you start to see certain behaviors that really all point to one thing, I own you. And that's ultimately the wolf's uh, calling card. They own you through behavior that ultimately makes you feel lesser than they are, powerless with them, and biblically responsible and obligated to surrender to them. Yeah, I, I like that. And I also, you know, a sheep, a wolf in sheep's clothing looks like a sheep. He talks Absolutely. like Absolutely. They know the verbiage. And I really believe that a lot of times we see a lot of um, people in ministry who are these wolves, unfortunately. I, that was a surprise to me when I started this ministry. Um, but I I have seen it so many times where they just get instant trust because of the, the words coming out of their mouths. They've done nothing to really deserve that trust, but it's just the position that they're in. Absolutely. And so, um, yeah, they, they, they look and they sound like it. And I would say, too, that they uh, one other thing I think I would add, because I've been noticing this a lot lately, is that they they put themselves above other people in like a position of judgment almost like it will be very subtle but it's yeah. like oh almost like the pharisees and the sadducees i think that yeah. they're very good examples of what abusers look like yeah and 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 one of the things that always is true of that wolf is and you can test them say no yes <laughs> yeah the wolf cannot handle no or your agency power, authority, and ability to make your own decision independent of their opinion and or theology. When you are dealing with a wolf, no is kryptonite. Yes. Amen. Wow. Yes. So true. And I think sometimes in this moment, we kind of do victims of domestic violence a disservice by always labeling and calling everything narcissistic abuse, because then you start to look at that and you'd be like, well, that's not there. This symptom is not there. And you begin not to see it and you miss the point. It's, you not, missed it. it's not about a mental disorder. It's about power and control. And as Andre says, he works with um, G5, which is our men who use corpse control support group for them that helps them heal. It's He's not like, a support group. It's intervention. Intervention. <laughs> supporting mm -hmm. our inter intervention. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I messed up. Our intervention group. And he says, we know one thing about these men. They do what they do because they want what they want when they want it. Absolutely. All. And that is the root right. of it. It's entitlement and control. No personal disorder, no mental disorder. It's they want what they want when they want it. And when they don't, they become a toddler and a two-year-old that throws a tantrum. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so let's switch over now uh, to 
what are fruits or fruit? I guess I would say the fruit of the spirit. What are fruit of a truly, genuinely healthy Christian that is not an abusive person? Man, are you talking about, uh, I talk a lot about, and, and I get the question a lot, right? Uh, how do I tell if this man, and I'm just using that, uh, the masculine, because it, it represents uh, the majority of, of individuals uh, that I talk to. Uh, how do we tell if this individual is truly a genuine uh, person in terms of, and I'm talking about the intimate partner. How do we tell if we inter you know meet someone and, 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 and how do we tell if this individual is a, a genuine or, or versus a fake or, or a wolf or uh, you know, a jerk. How do we tell? You know, it's it's the burning question, right? And one of the things that I'm always amazed by, and it's, I, I, and I talk to hundreds, literally hundreds of people, uh, victims and survivors on, on this subject. Um, one of the things that has to happen before we can make any kind of a determination with regards to a person's character and or uh, behavioral uh, fruit is we have to have for ourselves the definition of that. We have to have for ourselves and as a part of our boundaries, those behaviors that represent uh, red flag and or contradiction, right? But in order for you to and us to be able to identify contradiction, we have to firstly define what is that fruit? What we're, we're fruit inspectors. We're called to be fruit inspectors. Therefore, we have to have an understanding of the fruit, right? What that, that, that we're looking for, because the fruit of the spirit is love, you know, patience, self-control. You have to have an experience in order for the fruit to actually be manifested. The fruit doesn't exist by reading it. The fruit exists because of circumstance conditions that causes an individual to have to behave accordingly, right? So self-control. If the individual is interacting with you and you say no and or you have reason to compromise with that individual or you have a boundary that that individual cannot, will not uh, respect, honor. He has no fruit of self-control. And so you have to uh, associate fruit with behavior that contradicts that fruit, right? Because mm -hmm. unless circumstance presents itself, that individual won't have reason or opportunity to display that fruit. And one of the things that oftentimes is asked is, oh, well, how do I know uh, that the individual has the fruit of, of, of patience? Well, you have to have a circumstance that would require the individual to be patient. And so as you're dating or as you're interacting with folk, it becomes more so about us praying attention, praying attention to those behaviors that would contradict patients. You're setting up a, a meeting or you're, you're, you're going to be meeting with the individual, uh, but it's going to be later than what you originally had hoped and or planned. The individual uh, becomes irritated. They become irritable. Uh, you can't go when they want you to go. You can't participate when they want you to participate. In essence, you're not able to conform to their requirements or conditions. You will find out if they have the fruit of patience because it will be displayed in their intolerance of you and or their inflexibility, right? And so this is something that will help us as we interact with individuals to understand fruit. Fruit is the byproduct of consequence or circumstance that causes the individual's behavior to support that fruit. Yep. And so we're really talking about behavior that supports 
fruit. We have to become students of and develop for ourselves understanding of behavioral characteristics that agree with and contradict fruit. Amen. I often tell women, a lot of times the women that come through our ministry want to work it out. They want their marriages to last or to work or to be repaired or whatever. And um, and we know that that's possible. It's not as probable as the other alternative, mostly, I've, uh, partly, I think, because there's really not good help for the guys. And so that's one of the reasons we're doing this group. It wasn't really part of our intention for the ministry. But, you know, we can these women now can say, well, we've tried everything. And the, because we know that it's going to take some uh, consequences for him, for those guys. Uh, usually separation is part of that. Absolutely. They have to be willing to humble themselves. You know, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And these guys are the most proud people you'll ever meet. Um, and so for them to finally humble themselves, that would be, there would be great fruit from that if we could see it. I always tell women, I said, you really want to see if he's genuine, then do something that would have made him mad in the past. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Try him. Try yeah. him. The yeah. Bible says, you know, and I tell uh, folk, align your emotions with God's word. God did not say, trust him. God said, test him. Test every spirit, not trust every spirit. Right. When we align ourselves with God's word, your apology means nothing to me. And the 1500th apology means nothing to me because through divine wisdom, I have ability to test you. Yeah. I have ability to determine whether or not your proclivity, tendency, habit, pattern has changed. And that will be evidenced by behavior. I don't have to believe you. I have to see it. Yeah. And oftentimes what we do in our interaction with, especially in the cases of, like you said, someone uh, trying to figure out whether or not they should forgive or, or, or go back to or reconcile, the answer is based upon what proof. Right. If the yeah. proof doesn't exist that change has occurred, then going back means going back to the same situation. Yeah. Amen. And so uh, we have we get this a lot and, and churches will tell women just, you know, forgive and forget. But, you know, scripture doesn't tell us to forgive and forget. God forgets it or he puts, you know, he, he cast our, mm -hmm. our uh, sins into the sea of forgetfulness. However, he doesn't tell us to trust somebody that can't be trusted. He talks about testing fruit, just like you're talking about. And so there is actually a question here that might that kind of goes along those lines. I tell people all the time, forgiveness I can freely give, but trust has to be earned. <laughs> right. And, um, and so a, a question here is, how do we as abuse victims respond when we reach, oh, there's somebody commented and it went away, <laughs> when we reach out for help and are told that our spouses are not our enemies? Wow. You know, the, 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 the amount of foolishness that uh, abuse victims uh, are told is, is it never ceases to amaze me. Uh, mm -hmm. The individual isn't your enemy. They are not your partner. And there's a distinction. You don't have to be or consider view the individual as the enemy, quote unquote. But they are not a partner. They are not honoring the responsibilities of partner. We have to elevate the discussion of covenant responsibility. Mm -hmm. The issue is you are not honoring the covenant responsibilities that God commanded you. As a result, you are subjecting my inheritance to bondage. Your behavior is imprisoning my inheritance. You are denying me God's plan and promise for my life. Whether you are my enemy or not matters none. What matters is I am a child of God. And that comes before you. 
And so, therefore, if you are not going to honor the covenant that God created for me and the life that he planned for me, then I must put you on notice. I will not. I will not allow for you to deny me God's plans and promises for my life. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was powerful. Joy, you're muted. Well, and I used to think that, you know, I was turning the other cheek when I did all that. And that is not what it meant at all in scripture that honestly is talking about taking an insult for the sake of the gospel. But I think it's the opposite. When you're bowing down to an abusive person, it's not the most loving thing to do. When you actually say no to sin, then hopefully it's going to get him to that place where there are consequences enough for him to be broken enough to humble himself before God. Otherwise, you know, you're going to, uh, well, be like me. If you, anybody who's read my book knows, somebody told me it was like read, watching a horror movie, like, don't go back in there. Cause I, quit yeah. many times. but the thing is that we, we, we want it to work out, but we, we have to do something different. We can't keep doing the same thing, which is bowing down, bowing down, bowing down to sin. It's not going to give you any kind of different result. If you want no. to, and if you want to love that person well, then you call them to account for their sin. Not in absolutely any right. No, it's it, and you know one of the things that oftentimes is confused is that you know we're telling you know, someone said to me uh, the other day that uh, I I I was not considering the husband as God does and his authority and his um, honor and all of these other you know, things that the entitled believe come without responsibilities. Uh, and, and, and it's my contention and belief that we should start saying God's relationship, God's marriage covenant, covenant comes with responsibilities. Amen. And when we acknowledge that, we then have to understand why God says in Romans 1 and 28 that if you should behave towards him in the way that an abuser behaves towards a wife, God will turn that individual over to a reprobate mind. If you behave towards God as you behave towards, a, as an abuser behaves towards a wife, God will turn that individual over to a rep reprobate mind. God does not tolerate the rebellious and the wicked, the unrepentant and the intentional. And we know that God said, if you behave towards her in that manner, I will cut your prayers off. First Peter 3, 7. God never even instructed the church to tolerate an individual who behaves in that way towards the flock towards the body in first corinthians 5 11 it says don't even eat with that person yeah and in second timothy 3 1 through 5 it says have nothing to do with the individual see what we've done is created the illusion that love has no discipline that agape love means Eros. Eros is the intimate partner love. Agape is God's love for mankind leading to salvation. But even God's love comes with discipline. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. You will reap what you sow. That is the same God that will invite you into heaven, but you will not go without punishment for behavior that is unacceptable and or that is sinful. And so what we're oftentimes doing is forcing victims into this mindset mode of believing they have no agency. God has no boundaries that this man is supposed to uh, 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 consider and or use as as a means of determining 
whether or not she is being treated in the way that God commanded him to treat her. It's very simple. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now, you can't go too many ways left. Husbands, love your wives as, as, as Christ loved the church. How do you fit abuse into that? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And you know what? It's like, I think it's especially egregious and God hates it the most when it is done in his name. And Absolutely. Scripture doing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. In, 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 in Psalms 11, 5, he says he, he hates it with a passion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that verse where it talks about it's better for you to cast a millstone around your neck and drown yourself in the depths of the sea than the cause one of these little ones who believe in me to offend. What that is basically That's saying awesome. is like those who are trusting in God, you are taking their faith. And yes, you are. Yes, you are just depleting them of that and making them fear like God is their abuser. And God hates that so much. He would rather them drown themselves in the sea with a millstone tied around their neck. That's how God Absolutely. Is. And that's and how he if you Yes. Know. Yes. And, and he tells them in Matthew 23, you travel across land and sea to make a convert and only to make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. With the teaching that ultimately uh imprisons and and converts their belief this fragile belief they've destroyed it with false teaching mm -hmm. resulting in this individual erroring and or unknowingly uh going against the word of god so this is the issue of false teaching as it relates to abuse victims. You can make an individual twice as much a child of hell as you are by causing them to believe things contrary to the word of God. And so the suffering, as, as an example, you know, oftentimes victims tell me that the individual leader, pastor, whomever told them that, um, Suffering in marriage is the equivalent of suffering for Christ's sake. And so to do so is to honor God in the suffering that they are experiencing in, in the marriage. That may sound noble, but it's an absolute lie. Yes. Because it would contradict, do not throw your pearls down before swine. Mm-hmm. It would contradict if the home is not deserving, let your peace return to you. So we know that God does not have, or rather we know that God has boundaries, right? Uh, and those boundaries enable us to guard our heart because everything we do flows from it. And so if we allow our hearts to be harmed and abused uh, with impunity, bad company corrupts good character. This individual's behavior ultimately and eventually will corrupt our faith because our tolerance is breeding contempt for the word of God. Amen. Amen. So true. Yeah, I wish that I just wish it's like doing this work. We see it. And it's like as we are doing our protect the flock trainings that our pastors go in and train other churches, the pastors are like, oh, my goodness, now that I see it. I can't unsee it. It's, yeah. it's so prevalent in the churches. And yet we have this you know, mindset that we still, everybody's trustworthy. But you would think by now with all the stuff that's come out now, just recently with the Southern Baptist Convention, um, the sex, uh, sexual abuse cover-ups, uh, all there's so many scandals and so many things that have made the news. Yeah. Uh, we need to, to be more diligent. And I think that's why maybe people are starting to listen, because honestly, I've been doing this work since about 1997. And people, churches were like, we don't have domestic abuse in our church. Right. <laughs> and, uh, right. Now we're actually starting to listen more and more. And I think it's like 
thankfully, you know, it says in Ephesians that we expose the evil deeds of darkness to the light. And as right. the more we expose it, we can do it again without being mean. Um, I think there's mm -hmm. some people there. That my friend Chris Moles calls them attacktivists instead of activists. We can be, uh, we can speak the truth in love and say, brothers and sisters, this not ought not be, and we should we should not tolerate this kind yeah. of behavior within the church. Yeah, yeah. I had an individual tell me yesterday, day before yesterday, I should say, advocating for abuse victims is the equivalent of condoning uh, divorce. Uh, and that was his take on a message about a survivor who had been viciously abused for years by gun, by fist, by every manner of evil. And the individual then used murder-suicide as his tactic uh, for preventing her from leaving. If you leave, I'm going to kill myself and the kids. This behavior went on for years. She was finally able to escape. We were one of those resources um, that provided funding for her tickets, her flight. But the point being is the individual responded with, that is supporting divorce for little differences in a marriage. That's what he said. Oh, I remember seeing that comment. <laughs> well, Greenshot for that. little for little differences in a I'll marriage. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Well, we and we hear that kind of stuff. And then if they knew what good advocates do, even advocates that are trained in worldly uh, models are taught we don't tell victims of abuse what to do. No, that's not no. Our agency. Right? No. It, Basically, what we're here to do is to support them, to help them explore their options. We never, at Call to Peace, we never tell anybody to get a divorce. We don't recommend it. We just give them the options to get safe, to get to, get to a place where they, their relationship with God is healed because abuse damages their relationship with God. It, it damages their view of themselves. And so that's what our job is to do. And then God, they have a Holy Spirit in them. If they're believers, the Holy Spirit is the one that tells them how to proceed, not us. Not us. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Our, 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 our responsibility and focus is safety and stability. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And it gives them that opportunity to reconnect with God when you allow them to make their own choices, those scary choices that they're having to make for the first time, because maybe some of them hadn't been able to pick out what they're wearing every single day. So now they've got absolutely in front of them. It makes them go cling to God versus you. When you say pray about it, you know, seek the Lord, he will speak to you. It allows them to heal as he leads and guide them because he's going to lead and guide them in truth. He's going to lead and guide absolutely. them best for them and they can grow in their faith through Absolutely. that and that's what a good advocate does and i'm so grateful for our advocates that that do that and um and my heart is broken over that whole quote of what somebody said about little indifferences for divorce and that too is an issue in our culture where people are just still idolizing marriage like right. god loves people so much more than institutions and so um that is heartbreaking yeah and 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 you know i think it goes back to as well you know, the, the covenant. And that's why I focus on that so much in, in, in what I say and talk about is we start to miss, a, we miss it. Mm -hmm. An abused victim does not leave an abuser. He escapes bondage. Yes. We have to stop defining an abusive relationship as marriage. Because it is not defined, nor is it described in the Bible as marriage. It's defined as bondage. It's defined as bondage. Once we make the distinction between bondage and marriage, we will never call an abusive relationship a marriage. Because God doesn't. It is not defined as such in Ephesians 5, 21 through 33. There is the word abuse, tolerance of abuse, the subjugation and or the destruction of woman is not contained in God's marriage covenant, and which is Ephesians 1, uh, uh, 5, 21 through 33. 
So how we have begun to create all of these behaviors that have been grafted into the covenant uh, is what has caused for a lot to believe, many, that when an abused victim stands up for her safety and stability, she's leaving the abuser. No, the abuser left her behaviorally. Yes. Departed the relationship behaviorally and left her to now be responsible or put in the position to get safety and stability. We are losing it because we keep jumping over the fact that the victim was put in a position because of the departure from the covenant to need safety and stability as the result of a departure from the covenant. Amen. I cannot agree with you more. He's the one that forsook when he forsook the covenant um, right. and broke his vows before God. Right. You know, and I mean, I, that's, that's the whole reason for the name of the ministry called to peace ministry. So for all mm -hmm. years and years and years, I didn't believe in divorce. And I kept saying, God hates divorce. God mm -hmm. hates divorce to the point that my 12 year old daughter says, mom, why don't you just get out? Because it had gotten so dangerous. And I said, God hates divorce. And she says, God hates divorce, but he's going to hate it a lot more when my mom is dead. And yes. Yeah. And so one day I'm reading in First um, Corinthians chapter seven. And of course, I'm reading a passage I've read many times before. And I actually had biblical cause for divorce, you know, according to Jesus. And yet I still, I think my parents' divorce affected me. My parents' divorce, it seemed like they didn't try hard enough. There was really no abuse uh, that I could see. It was just they decided to grow apart and all that. But it hurt me. And so I'm holding on to this 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 marriage and I'm listening to things like focus on the family and how terrible divorce is for your children. And so it was very difficult for me to want to leave. I'm reading, though, through 1 Corinthians 7, and it talks about if an unbeliever wants to leave, well, Lord, he doesn't want to leave, then let him go. In such cases, the believing spouse is, um, and, and, he's, and he says he's a believer. So there were two things, right? He says he's a believer. He doesn't want to leave, but he's acting like an unbeliever. And right. he, he's already abandoned me. He's completely abandoned the covenant, and he is not following anything that he promised me at that altar. And so, right. to, and so, but every time I would read that, I would argue with the scripture, you know, and I was reading it with an eye towards the letter of the law. But that day, when I got down to the part where it says, in such cases, the believing spouse is not under bondage because I yes. under bondage because yes. God has called us to peace. Yes. Like, oh, Lord, you're not calling me to stay here and suffer. I <laughs> was supposed to suffer for the sake of my marriage. And again, it wasn't the best thing I could do to love my husband, even. I was right. allowed him i was allowing him to just flourish in his sin in fact all these people that tell women submit 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 the more i submitted to him the worse he got it was like oh, absolutely. Him. it because will I get worse <laughs> i was feeding his sense of entitlement so the, the way that we do things in christian circles is just it, it actually sets up men to be more abusive a lot of mm -hmm. times because here i am bowing down to that and in me thinking that i can't even absolutely uh, Set up a boundary and say no to his sin. So, you know, this is so yeah, important absolutely. for us to understand. That's not God's heart. God does call us to peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. hallelujah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think when we start having dialogue and we start having conversations like this publicly, right, a lot of a, a lot of victims will, their, their spirit will jump. Because in the spirit, they knew that was true. The teaching yes. and influences outside of them was trying to convince them that it was a lie. But the Holy Spirit was telling them, I came to set the captives free. You were never called to bondage. You are not following that person is not following God if they are canceling my promise to you. I came that you might have life and life more. But you, you, you're not with someone who's canceling why I hung, bled, and died. 
there is no way that you are with someone who is canceling why I hung, bled, and died. Amen. And so the Holy Spirit has already confirmed it, but the voices outside have tried to convince the victim that they're crazy for believing what Christ said. Yes. It's gaslighting your own faith in Jesus. Gaslighting your own faith in Jesus, right? Yeah. All right, Lauren, we're running with close to an hour. Do you, have, you got any more questions for Pat, Patrick? We probably need to wrap I, up. I do. <laughs> yes, I do have another question. Um, my final question is, um, hopefully we can end here on a very encouraging note. I hope all of this has been encouraging to everybody here too as well. Um, what truths would you share with a woman who has been impacted by abuse from those who profess to be Christians? <laughs> another one of those that I hear often and, and many have been spiritually abused in the course of or in conjunction with right their domestic abuse. It's it's almost I would say the the chances of an individual being spiritually abused uh, in conjunction with the domestic abuse within the Christian community is, is, is probably 90 percent. The Bible has been misused, abused misrepresented in conjunction with their abuse. That has had a profound effect on uh, an individual's faith. Uh, most will walk away from that with a uh, belief and with a hurt that is going to be uh, projected or uh, pointed uh, at God. And, and, and it's understandable. The God they thought they knew was turned into a flying monkey, a, a, a co-conspirator in their bondage. And when, when, when that happens, understandably, it shakes an individual's faith. It can cause an individual to really want to step away from relationship with God so that they can recover from the damage done by the individuals who were using God's name to justify uh, wickedness. Mm -hmm. And so what I say to individuals who come out of those kinds of an environment uh, environments, once they've had an opportunity to adjust to their 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 freedom get back into the bible and begin reading it for yourself mm -hmm. begin reading the bible for yourself because you're going to discover that all of those scriptures that were used to abuse were misrepresentations false and intentionally twisted for the convenience and the benefit of the abuser, the flying monkey, the individuals who are complicit in the, abu uh, the abuser's behavior, but twisted for the convenience of the abuser or those who were holding the coats for the abusers. And once you start to read the word of God and realize that God never said that, that was never what God meant, that it was not, is not God's heart. You're going to find a revelational connection with God that reaffirms everything that you believe, Amen. everything that you believe. And it's going to cause you to understand there are individuals in this world who are hell bent and determined to use the word of God for selfish gain. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, and if you guys are interested and want a, a community to help you untwist those scriptures, please reach out to us about joining a support group. We have free um, online support groups across the country and a couple of foreign nations, and some of them are local even. Um, but this is what we do because, you know, we know how how much bondage we get into because of the misunderstanding of scripture. And so that is really what our, our 
uh, support groups. Joy, how does that Joy, How does that work? Someone wants to participate in a group. Uh, are these online? Are they Zooms? How, how does that work? Mostly online and Zoom. Some of them are um, actually in different locations across the country. Some of them meet in person. But you can oh, go okay. to callpeace.org and there's a form to fill out. See, Kathy, our friend Kathy is on the spot. She's just keep, she's posted all sorts of amazing links here. But that one, if you fill that out, we can get you um, signed up on a list to join a support group. You know, we have to wait for the, the next one to start sometimes. Um, but generally, we have them starting every month or two um, because we're constantly looking for people to lead support groups, too. So if you'd like to be trained to become a support group leader, um, we, we kind of like people who've got some kind of a background in leading Bible studies and things like that for our support groups. Um, but you can also sign up in that, on that same page. Um, on calltopeace.org, at the bottom of the page, it says lead a support group. You can sign up there and they'll contact you to get trained. So are the, um, are the support groups topically, uh, yes. are they topical as in they, they, they cover different topics or are, are they all covering the same topic? It's very topical. Um, so I basically worked at a domestic violence shelter. So we have some of the, the things like the power and control wheel. And we talk about that. And we actually talk about it from a biblical and trauma based perspective. So it's both. It's uh, actually based on my workbook. And, and so we have topics like overcoming fear, um, overcoming, basically dealing with your grief. Um, mm -hmm. How do you what? Let's talk about forgiveness. What does that actually look like? Does that mean that you have to reconcile? Does that mean you have to trust? No. And so we talk through all of those things. Um, we talk about boundaries. We talk about the overcoming trauma and the impacts that trauma has on your body and how you heal from trauma, because that's something it was hard to even get started and to even concentrate enough to do the work of the support group unless you've got some healing for your trauma. And we know that that takes whole body methods. Um, in fact, for me, uh, my healing came through meditating on scripture. I had it plastered all over my walls. There were some scriptures I couldn't even look at because I had used them against myself. Uh, mm -hmm. But there were some that the ones that were, uh, the Lord compared himself to a mother. Can a nursing mother forget the babe at her breast? Well, even she may forget, but I will never forget you. I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. And mm -hmm. so reading passages like that and just meditating on them and not just a little bit, not just saying it a few times, I would read it out loud and go, Lord, if, if you don't help me, because this was in the nineties and there was no help, there was no call to peace. There was no help from a Christian right. perspective that I could find. But as I meditated on that truth, eventually all the signs of PTSD that I had just subsided. And the funny thing is now I had about three or four years ago, I saw somebody who was talking about meditation, biblical meditation. And I mean, again, the way we meditate in the West sometimes has not been like what I think they did in Bible times. You know, you're basically they would take a passage of scripture and they would say it again and again and again. And that's kind of what I was doing. It was almost like a mantra mantra. And then so uh, basically, the more I did that, the less my symptoms were. And so I'm watching this brain scan this day, day and this guy showing a, a, um, a brain scan of somebody who was just studying. <clears throat> so basically getting information because, you know, when you're having a panic attack after abuse, you can say, I'm OK, I'm OK, but you still don't feel OK. But this is only the left side of the brain that's active when you're using your logic or studying. But when you meditate, the whole brain lights up with activity. And we know that trauma is caught in parts of the brain that are not reached by logic. And so that's why trauma has to right. be whole brain um, activities. And true meditation is a whole brain activity. So I kind of think like the Lord accidentally well he didn't accidentally but to me it felt like it was an accident like it just it was like serendipity just this th wonderful thing that happened in this healing process where my triggers went away and everything over time as i meditated um so we we talk about that but there's also you know methods that you can go to uh, counselors who use emdr and different things like that um and so basically i think there's like four 14 or 16 lessons in there um, mm, okay on different Topics. And we can, I thought I had maybe sent you a book last year, but maybe not. We can oh, you know, that. you sent it to me. I was asking for those who were listening. Okay. Okay, good. 
Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So we would love to have you join us. Um, and that would be, um, it can be a great part of your healing. In fact, we had a woman that got up and spoke at our retreat this year, and she said that she ran out of money for counseling. And her therapist sent her to one of our support groups, and it was a, she's been able to really move forward in her healing process just being in that group. Not saying don't go for therapy, but I'm saying that it, it, she had the, those keys from her therapist and um, having the community and then having truth, I would say truth that sets us free kind of truth, you know, where Absolutely. you've had the scriptures that have been untwisted and things like that. Absolutely. So, now, and I always am, am saying to folks, therapy lasts for an hour. You have 168 hours in the week. So it's therapy plus the after work, the work that happens outside of therapy. There is when you will, will, will need the support, the reinforcements of individuals, of programs like Call to Peace because you're complementing therapy. It's not a replacement, it's a complement. And for some who can't even afford therapy, it's their personal healing plan and path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and we just definitely do teach them how to do that meditation, that whole brain activity and talking about just the way you think is going to control the way you know the scripture says as a man thinks so is he as a woman so is, thinks, so is she no matter what we're thinking on and we as victims of abuse i had this negative um just narrative running through my head all the time and i i caught it and i'm like wait a minute i'm always thinking about him i'm always thinking about what happened and i had to do what it says in uh you know the bible it says take every thought captive i did yes and i, and I would take a scripture that counteracted are contradicted. I don't know. My words aren't coming out right today, but it would contradict the lie that I was believing. And it says, you know, if it's, if I'm thinking that I've been rejected, then I would say to myself, he will never leave me, never forsake me, that he's, he's faithful. So you find these truths. In fact, I have a, a whole database at the end of both of my books, which were, they were scriptures that the Lord really used to bring healing to my heart that I share in the back of those books. Um, so, Lauren, I know we need to wrap this up, but thank you, Patrick. It's been amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so, we enjoy it, it so much. We could go all day because we really enjoy talking to you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and just appreciate Wonderful. Yes, yeah, yeah. so I wanted to end with a reminder that one, first is taste and see that the Lord is good. And so prove him and try him in these things. Um, as you're going Patrick was mentioning getting back into scriptures for the first time, get in there and, and test the Lord and see that he is good as you follow him. That will heal your relationship with God that's been damaged as you see him provide. And at Call to Peace, we're really grateful that we're able to be the hands and feet of Jesus to so many women that are reaching out for support and help and pointing them to the love of Christ. Um, but once again, as a reminder, it's Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And the only reason why we're able to do that is because of the support of financial partners that are willing to come alongside us so that we can provide our support groups, our advocacy, our church partnership free of charge to churches, to women, um, and help them ever come. So if you are watching this and you're able to donate, we have a $25,000 matching grant. Please consider it so we can reach our goal of $135,000 in less than six days. That would be and great. And if you can't donate, just pray because we really need a miracle. We're really running shorter than we normally would this time. The economy has really put a damper. People are still giving, but they're giving less. And so, um, you know, if everybody just who get watches this would give a little something, that's going to get us a whole lot closer to that goal. But we believe that God is a God of miracles. So we are trusting that, that he's going to do it. And we thank you guys for being a part of it. And Patrick, we're just so grateful for you and your ministry. So thank you. We hope you'll join us soon. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Thankful just to be here. Absolutely. I'm grateful for you. Thank you. I follow you regularly and so encouraged by you. So keep up the good work. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You guys thank have you. a good Bye. one. You too. Right. Bye, everybody. Bye.